Order, order. Question the Secretary of State for Works and Pensions, Justin Mathers. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Number one, please. Minister. With your permission, Mr Speaker, I'd like to answer question one, two and three together. People who are advised to shield and are unable to work from home may be furloughed. Those who are not furloughed may be eligible for a range of other financial support, including statutory sick pay or new style ESA, both of which remain payable from day one of a claim. Where eligible, a claim may also be made to universal credit. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many uh, disabled people are on legacy <coughs> benefits, which of course means they haven't had the £20 a week universal credit uplift that uh, has been made available. As the government didn't vote against uh, our motion last week to retain that payment, I presume they understand the value of retaining it. So uh, will the government now do the right thing and ensure all disabled people can also have access to the extra cash as well? Minister. Well, we've shown as a, a government through the uh, support we're providing and over £9 billion of extra welfare support, uh, those on legacy benefits will have benefited from the annual up rating and depending on individual circumstances, if that claimant would be better on universal credit, then they can look to transfer over. We now go up to Liverpool to Bill Esterson. Bill Esterson. But Mr Speaker, there are 2.2 million people who are having to shield. Uh, many disabled people can't work from home and don't qualify for furlough. So they have to, and if they're on sick pay, it's only £95.85, which doesn't even come close to the definition that the Prime Minister tried to use on Thursday of doing uh, what it takes to look after people. So can I push the Minister not to give the same tired answer about what he's done for other people and to answer the question my honourable friend just asked. When is the government going to give the support to disabled people so that they can be protected and stay at home? Thank you, Mr Speaker. So the level of statutory sick pay is just part of the safety net. They may also be eligible for new style ESA or universal credit. And for those disabled people who are looking to work from home, we've extended the support that is available through access to work, allowing for people to uh, have additional support for their needs or equipment. And that is something that we will keep in place beyond COVID. Let's send up to Ealing with Mr Brenda Sharma. Mr. Rendersharma. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the minister uh, for his response, which I still believe is not very satisfactory response. And I give him another opportunity to come back and give more concrete answer. When will the minister end the discrimination against disabled people and offer the same uplift that universal credit claimants have been given to those a legacy claimant on employment and support allowance and job seekers allowance that disproportionately support the disabled. Well, further to uh, the principle that if you could, as a claimant, be better off on UC than on legacy benefits and therefore the ability to apply to go on to UC, we have shown as a government that we've increased support for people with disabilities through the main disability benefits by, in real terms, an extra £3 billion since 2010. We are proud of our record. We go to the Chair of Select Committee, Stephen Timms. Uh, speaker, but people claiming severe disability premium cannot switch to universal credit. They're not allowed to. The cost facing many in that group have gone up more than average during the pandemic. Why is that particular group denied the £20 a week increase? Well, that actual uh, rate, the gateway, the SDP gateway, comes to an end in a couple of days, so they will be able to also look to see whether they would be better off under universal credit. But as I said, it's part of the wider support available, and particularly those with disabilities will have benefited from the annual up rating increases in DLA, PIP, attendance allowance, and that is how we've delivered the additional £3 billion worth of support in real terms for those with disabilities and health conditions. I said to Southland with Vicky Foxcroft, the Shadow Minister. Vicky Foxcroft. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I just say how utterly disappointing it is to still have no uplift to legacy benefits 10 months into this crisis? Now, since the start of the pandemic, shielded people have been an afterthought. The increased costs they are facing are doing untold damage to their lives, and the government's solution of claiming statutory sick pay is woefully inadequate. 
Will the government finally do the right thing and ensure shielding people or ha people having to isolate are furloughed? Guaranteed furlough from day one will help people stay home and support businesses up and down the country. I hope the Shadow Minister welcomes the continued and extensive support that the government has provided through schemes such as furlough, the additional money, the additional £9 billion in welfare support, and specifically for those who are clinically extremely vulnerable, the second £32 million additional support provided through local authorities to help with those uh, following the shielding guidance. And in these critical times, certainty is vital, and perhaps that the Shadow team should reflect on this with their random decision to try and cancel universal credit that has stood up so well to support those people in the most need during this unprecedented times. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Work coaches are empowered to support claimants through the best and most appropriate channels, whether online, by phone or in person, with job centres remaining open to those who need extra support and are unable to interact uh, with us on the phone or digitally. We're going over to South and West with Sir David Amis. Sir David. A number of my constituents in South End West who suffer from mental or physical disabilities do not have access to computers or the internet. Many of them rely on in-person support in normal times through places such as the Citizens Advice Bureau or the wonderful King's Money Advice Centre. With many in these vulnerable groups unfortunately now shielding, what assurances can my honourable friend give me that support is me being made accessible to those without online access? My honourable friend is a strong advocate for supporting his most vulnerable claimants and his local advocacy groups. As I've set out, we will look at the most appropriate way to communicate with claimants, including by phone or through advocates, where they do not have access to the, uh, the internet. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whilst face-to-face -face work capability assessments remain temporarily suspended, where possible, we are conducting paper-based assessments and, in and have introduced telephone assessments and are trialling video assessments. We closely monitor processing times and are prioritising new claims and changes of circumstances. Let's head up to Edmonton with Kate Osmond. Kate Osmond. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In their latest briefing, Child Poverty Action Group have highlighted the plight of universal credit claimants whose work capability assessments have been delayed indefinitely because they require a face-to-face -face assessment. These claimants have gone months without hundreds of pounds of extra support they need. What assurances can the Minister provide these claimants about when they will be able to access this element of a universal credit? Um, we are doing absolutely everything we can to ensure claimants are accessing the support as quickly as possible, which is why at PACE we introduce both telephone assessments and now video assessments, and wherever possible to conduct an assessment via paper based, we continue to do all we can, and as soon as it is safe to do so, we will return to include face to face assessments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, although I'm actually in Gould. Um, if we, with the upcoming Health and Disability Green Paper and the National Strategy for Disabled People, it is vital, Mr. Speaker, that those with real, life, uh, real lived experiences. Uh, are able to form government policy uh, and shape policy in this area. So can the Minister assure me that that will be the case? <laughs> good to see. Come on in, Minister. I, I thank my honourable friend, who is a real champion of real lived experience through his casework and his speeches in Parliament, and I can reassure him that both the uh, DWP Health and Disability Green Paper and the National Strategy for Disabled People will be shaped by those with real lived experiences. And I know, as a proactive Member of Parliament, he will be happy to host his own stakeholder engagement event with his local advocacy groups. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Research from the TUC shows that statutory sick pay currently covers less than a fifth of annual earnings. Does the Secretary of State agree with the head of the government's test and trace programme, Dido Harding, that low levels of statutory sick pay are acting as a financial barrier to people being able to self-isolate, creating additional public health risks? What steps is the Secretary of State taking to ensure that statutory sick pay provides sufficient support to enable everyone to self-isolate when necessary? Minister. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As already set out, it is part of a menu of support that uh, people could uh, benefit from, including Universal Credit, New Style ESA, and support provided through local authorities, or if qualifying, £500 uh, through the Test and Trace scheme. But on a wider point, through the Health is Everyone's Business, we have covered a range of measures to look at reforming SSP, and we will publish those findings shortly. But they will look at things such as rate, the structure, the lower earnings threshold, and actually dealing with the issue that you are either 100% fit or 100% sick without any phase return to work. That's something we're determined to change. Well,